All right. All right. Good morning, guys. Welcome back to day two of the Find Your Voice Earth mini course with Honest Birth Talk. I'm Michaela, and that's Crystal. Hello. We're the birth besties. And uh, we can't wait to talk about managing other people's expectations for your birth today. So this is a great topic. Yesterday we made you, um, well, we didn't make you, but we asked you to write down your priorities for your birth. So now we're going to talk about other people's expectations and maybe even their priorities for your birth. But since you have your priorities, you're already on a path to be able to shift the conversation from what they experienced and what they want you to experience or avoid back to what's important to you, which is super important to have an idea of what you want. But uh, everybody just wants to give you all this information and sometimes tell you horror stories. <laughs> Right. I know. Yes. It, I think for, as women, we want to share our experiences because in a way it validates us. I think that's exactly right. We all want validation for what happened to us. And so if we can For the choices share, that we made. Right. For the choice. Exactly. Even if they, maybe you want to do something different, it's almost like you need someone to say, well, you know, I get it or, or whatever. I really think that some of those, um, being able to talk in those moms communities is so important for this reason. Yeah. So well, then we're you know, expecting our pregnant friends to take on all of our stuff. Right, exactly. So basically, you know, one of the ones I heard the most was, what, you want to have a natural childbirth? Oh, you're too small. You're too small. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm like, what? what does size have to do with that? But in the beginning, before I knew what my priorities were, comments like that significantly um, impacted me because all that doubt started coming into my mind that, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I can't do this. Right. So instead, or educating myself on how to achieve a natural childbirth, in my case, gave right. me the power and the confidence to be able to, to respond to those comments and say, well, thank you for your input, but... Um, I'm really going to give it a try. Yeah. No, so, thank you, but no, thank you. <laughs> thank exactly. You. It, very politely saying thank you, but no, thank you. Right. Exactly. What was some of the ones you heard, Crystal? Um, well, I remember whenever I was, this wasn't really related to birth, but wanting to breastfeed twins. I mean, yeah. it's like, why? No, you can't. And I mean, I, I was just barely pregnant with them and it was already, no, you can't. And I'm like, that's oh. impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. I actually heard that. Or, and then whenever I was having the home birth after two C section, you can't do that. Mm -mm. You're yeah. going to die. I actually had someone tell me that you were going to kill yourself. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my God. Okay. Well, we're going to leave you over there. <laughs> so, so, one of the ways that we would suggest that you manage other people's expectations is again, knowing your priorities will help you feel confident um, in what your wishes and desires are. But then also, surrounding yourself with people that are going to support you in your decisions and not try to put their birth story on you. Right. So how do you do that? Where do you, how do you get, how do you go about surrounding yourself with the positive thoughts as opposed to the, you know, influx of you can't, or why would you want to? Well, I think you, if they're family, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt and maybe just not share as much with them. But you can really start to build a friendship and find a community that supports you. So like with Honest Birth Talk, we have a community of women who are like-minded. Um, there's other blogs and things to read out there where you can fill yourself full of the positive kind of a positive birth affirmations. Exactly. Stay away from Google though. Do oh. not Google. No, that, no. No. Come to us first and we will direct you to the resources that are going to help you achieve your, uh, your desired birth because yes, you want to get, make sure you're getting the right information in your hands and not misinformation. Right. And later we're going to cover some of, um, you guys are doing great on the homework. We, we are happy to wake up in the mornings and see all this, these really good responses. So, but right now we're going to bring on our special guest Desiree and she's going to give us some sleep tips for the newborn um, and let me see if I can get technology here and promote her so she can come on. There we go. I think she's here. Hi, Desiree. So I just had to unmute myself. 
technology. I know. Good morning, everybody. Um, so just to segue from the conversation uh, that Crystal McCalla said about people coming to you about priorities um, and, and coming to you and talking to you about what their opinions are, you're going to get some similar information when it comes to sleep as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> conflicting <laughs> conflicting everybody's gonna say things like oh my baby was such a good sleeper um and then you're gonna look and go well why isn't my baby a good sleeper um, what am I doing wrong? yeah what am I doing wrong um I think people just forget some of the the newborn stages and, and what they had to deal with so I'm here to set the stage for you and to let you know what to expect with newborn sleep and then also to tell you uh, what you could focus on to encourage good sleep habits from the very beginning. So a normal, um, a newborn it sleeps on average 14 to 17 hours a day. And I mean, that's a long time within a 24 hour period. So you yeah. yeah. are thinking to yourself, wow, I can get so much sleep. Um, but unfortunately, well, so I mean, unfortunately, their naps are very erratic in the first 12 weeks. Um, day sleep doesn't really organize until about three months of age. And that's if you have a really good sleeper. Um, there are some babies that their day sleep does not organize until about six months. Um, so sleep is very erratic for the first couple of weeks. So you just need to go with the flow. They could sleep from 15 minutes to three hours. Um, you, um, their wait time. So whenever you do feed them, their wait time should be no longer than 30 to 60 minutes. So you should try to encourage them to go back to sleep so that they don't get overtired. Um, a good way to, to encourage this, what I recommend is baby wearing. I think baby wearing is wonderful. Babies love to be close to their moms and snuggled. It's a great way to bond. You can get things done around the house. You can go out and about and the baby will sleep. Um, if you need a little rest, it's okay for your husband to baby wear. It's okay. Um, my husband actually did. Um, um, I also am okay and recommend my clients that bouncers with vibration because the baby is used to being walked and walked around because they were inside of your um, in utero for so long. So bouncers are okay, but you need to be, be right in front of them to be able to monitor them. So don't put them in their own room in a bouncer or something like that. Um, Bedtimes for newborns are typically late. So expect that the last feeding is going to happen between 9 and 11 o'clock at night. And then from there, you would put your baby down to sleep and you probably will get another two to three hour stretch until the next uh, waking for to be fed. Um, try to sleep when the baby is sleeping. I know that everybody says this. If you do have a, a toddler, I would suggest uh, recruiting family or neighbors or somebody to help out with that toddler, maybe to watch them him or her for four hours or three hours so that you could plan it out and try to get some rest while the baby's resting. Um, I, in my case, I hired a postpartum doula um, yes. and I only hired her actually once a week just to catch up on some Z's. So, cause that's what I could afford in my budget. Oh. Um, you can hire a mother's helper. Um, you, you know, possibly there's a, a neighborhood child, like a teenager that could take your toddler for a few hours, even um, somewhere nearby where the mother's around as well and explain what you're trying to achieve to get some rest. Uh, family, friends, there's different ways that you can try to get some sleep um, because newborn sleep is very erratic, um, but you will get nice chunks here and there, but your toddler might be running around or your older child and you need someone to help occupy their time and don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Cause I think that sleep is going to make you a better mom and balancing. Um, in terms of what to focus on, um, you can start this as early as day one is a bedtime routine. So for you new moms out there, bedtime routines are super important because they cue the baby that it's time for bedtime versus, um, you know, any other time of the day. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It could be something as simple as um, a feeding, uh, waddling, and then you know, reading a book or singing a song. Um, and I, I recommend to my clients to read the same book every night. We read Good Night Moon every single night. Oh, we yeah. read the same book too. It's Snuggle Puppy. So it's a cute. We only read it during bedtime. Yep. Um, there's been times where my baby's so tired, he actually starts crying when I bring the book out. <laughs> And he's like, I don't even want the book. I just want to go to sleep. Yeah. But I, and then I do a shorter version really quickly, but he is now seven months. He knows that book. We only use it for that. Um, yesterday I spoke on safe sleep environments. So make sure you incorporate that on what to focus on for the first, well, forever when you have your child, but right from the very get go. 
I recommend, I recommend using a white noise machine. Babies are used to sounds in utero that are as loud as a lawnmower, actually. So really loud. So when wow. it comes out into this universe, <laughs> when it's quiet, they are in shock because that's <laughs> they're used to it all so a steady white noise is great Uh, I I recommend just the the typical white noise sound or a fan sound not the ocean or the other sounds that are are not familiar to them they're used to more steady loud sound that's going on all the time okay uh no night lights uh you can have a dim light in the bedroom for feeding you know in the middle of the night uh, blue lights, you want to you want to stay away from blue lights because blue lights actually interfere with the circadian rhythms of the body. Oh. I learned with this last one in my in my training. So you want to you want to stick to some sort of warm light for the baby. Oh. Uh, in my in my baby's bedroom, I have a pink Himalayan salt lamp that I use. It's warm and it dims, and it was a lifesaver for us. And now you know we use it just as a very very dim because he's sleeping through the night. So we use it very dim just just to have something there comforting for him. Um, black, blackout blinds, invest on black and blackout blinds. Very yes. important. Babies are not scared of the dark. That's the wonderful thing that, you know, you're not going to get the monster stories until you have toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> so blackout blinds are very important, uh, when napping children, as well as using them for sleep. So when the early morning, uh, sun rises, that it's still dark in the room. Practice putting down your newborns, uh, sleep, uh, sleepy, but awake, but don't, don't stress yourself about it. If it's not working, don't force it, but just practice here and there. But again, if the baby's unhappy and crying, don't force it because they're a newborn and this is all new to them. And you're just trying to practice and show them um, some good sleeping habits. And most importantly, uh, my last point is uh, babies are born with day night confusion. I'm sh- you might've heard of this before. I'm not yes. sure. <laughs> so they don't come out knowing that it's daytime or nighttime. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to read a clock. I mean, <laughs> gosh, I can't believe it, right? Uh, in fact, uh, melatonin doesn't really kick into their bodies until about they're seven or eight weeks old. Uh, oh. But this is an interesting fact. If you're breastfeeding your baby, uh, breast milk does contain melatonin. Oh, okay. Babies get melatonin right from the get-go whenever, and, and at certain times it surges actually. So the, the female body, the mother's body is amazing. It knows when to surge that melatonin to come from the breast milk to help baby sleep at night. So just another reason why you should consider breastfeeding. That's um, amazing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so to help avoid day night confusion, uh, you could feed your baby. What I do is I never let my, and I recommend this to my clients, never let your baby sleep longer than two hours during the day, wake them up every two hours and give them a feed. And then you can put them back down to sleep. That's going to, that's going to help, uh, help their day be more organized, keep the lights on, keep music on, keep keep the TV on, do what you normally do throughout the day. You could put them in a pack and play in a safe place to sleep while you're getting things done or laying down yourself, but keep normal activities going on as if it's just your regular daytime. Right. Around eight o'clock, start winding down, uh, make the lights dim, make it very obvious that it's getting close to bedtime and just winding down time TV on very low. If you have TV on at all, uh, you know, just keeping things at a very calm level and calm environment for the baby. So they can help distinguish night and daytime. Right. And the last tip to help day and nighttime, which I have did with all my kids and I recommend to everybody is having a dramatic wake up in the morning. <laughs> what I mean by that is in the middle of the night, when you're feeding, you're just being very matter of fact, feeding, putting the baby down to go back to bed. You're not, you're not playing with them. You're not snuggling and holding them throughout the night. You should, it should be strictly business in the middle of the night. Unlike daytime where you might give them some tummy time, some play time and things going on. Right. But what I like to enforce is in the morning when you want your wake up time, let's just say you want to shoot for 6 or 7 a.m., which is a normal time for a baby to wake up, put on the lights, open up the blinds. Uh, I, every morning I go, good morning, baby, you know, and, uh, and he smiles now because he's seven months old. But if you just make it a very dramatic morning wake up with some morning snuggles and make it very happy and exciting, uh, that helps distinguish that it's morning as well. So, cause they're not going to get that in the middle of the night, but they'll right. know, they'll get used to that. And they'll know that that signals that that's the start of their day. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. So those are some initial tips. Um, and you could check out some more stuff on my website. I just had 
Just want to do a brief pitch real quick. I had my uh, 12 sleep tips for the 12 days of Christmas. Today was the 12th day. If you want to check out my Facebook. You can They're good. Them. They're really good sleep tips. You have to go over and watch them. <laughs> yeah, they actually even recommend some sleep tips for toddlers as well. Um, so you can go to my Facebook and that is facebook.com slash pediatric sleep coach. Yay. Bye. Thanks for you guys for yeah. So yeah. good. So good. I wish I knew. I wish I knew all this back then. The oh, whole morning wake up thing. <laughs> I know. I know. One of the, I just want to touch back real quick. You made a great point about how mom's breast milk knows when it's night or day. And yeah. that's why I always tell my clients when you are pumping, label your breast milk because you, your body does make milk for different scenarios. So if it's yeah. hot, versus cold your body your milk's going to be thicker when it's colder outside and more you know liquidy when it's um when it's hot outside just as as your breast milk changes from morning to night so totally a side tip uh yeah. it's a good tip. Are amazing it's amazing the science behind it and that your body automatically knows to produce extra melatonin at nighttime time. really it's it's, it's mind-blowing some of the things that it, we're able to do just Yep. All right. right. So now we're into the Q and A time. Yeah, Michaela, do you want to? Do you have your phone, or do you want me to? I do. I have them pulled up. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> so you, you can so start. Today we asked you guys to comment with some of the information that you've been given. The minute you know you find out you're pregnant, and then everybody's sharing. So, what are some of those things that people are sharing? Uh, Mary, ones on here. <laughs> There's some really good ones on here. Yeah, we can write a novel, right? About the oversharing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Mary, you talked about um, maybe you'll want to have a girl instead of a boy since you had a boy the first time. I don't know why people think it's okay <laughs> to make those comments because you're going to be blessed with whatever gender you're blessed with, and that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's a, that's kind of a hard one to navigate, but you just, for me, I would just smile and nod and say, I'd be happy with either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, breastfeeding is best. So this is, can be a touchy subject for some people. Um, really, honestly, you have to do what's best for you and for your family. Yeah. Now, that being said, if your desire is to breastfeed, and you're just not finding the support that you need to make it a successful experience, that's where we come in. Yeah. We can definitely help and guide you to the right resources so that you can have a better experience. And that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you breastfed one baby successfully, each child can, you know, can, um, can be a learning, a learning experience. I've breastfed three, and with the third, it was my hardest. It was my hardest experience ever. Yes. And anybody who says it's easy is, I don't think they're being honest with you. So I think it's important to just know that it will come, but the first few weeks are not, just know they're not going to be some glorious, magical experience in most cases. Right. <laughs> it's a learning curve. Do you have anything to input about that? About the oh, rest? Did you mention me? Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, actually, um, with the twins, I didn't breastfeed. Um, so I was overwhelmed with the idea of having twins. <laughs> yeah. So That's... it's okay. It's okay not to breastfeed because right. um, if you if you feel that it's right for your family. Right. I, I remember people judging me because I didn't want to breastfeed the twins. I thought to myself, if they were born prematurely, I would definitely pump or consider it. But they were born at 37 weeks and they were yeah. so happy. And I, my husband was traveling four days a week and my family's back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I had nobody to help out. Yeah, that's, so that's rough. I, I eliminated it from the equation to save my sanity. So, yeah. um, so I, I, you know, I don't, with my third, you know, it was different, but I, um, if you are having multiples, don't feel like you have to do it. If you want to try it, that's wonderful, but don't, don't feel ashamed. Cause I think that's one of the things that our culture. Has. Yeah. It's Mom, actually it's both ways about breastfeeding. Some people right. don't feel comfortable breastfeeding in front of people in public, but then, and there's all this breastfeeding, you know, is normal, which is wonderful because it is, it's nature. But at the same time, 
don't get upset if you no. don't feel like a failure. You got to, yeah. I mean, you gotta do what's right for you. There's so much going on with your body to begin with. So, and mom shaming is a is a real thing, and it's and again, I think just like I said at the beginning of this video, I really think it comes down to us trying to validate our own thoughts and feelings. And so you have to you have to do what's right for you. You have you cannot do what's right for everyone else because then you're the one having to deal with the consequences of it. You're the one having to figure out what works best in your life with your family dynamic. And that's what we are. That's why we are called honest birth talk. Right. This is, this is for you to figure out what's best for you and not what's best for everyone else. Right. So True. You are the mom. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, cloth diapering. That was another one that was brought up. Uh, People saying, I can't believe you're cloth diapering. Um, I, on the other hand, had the opposite experience. All my friends were cloth diapering and I wasn't. And I felt guilty about that. But it just wasn't feasible for my family. So again, do what's right for you. I cloth diapered twins until like they were 18 or 19 months. And then I was just like, I I'm done. I can't wow, do this anymore. Wow, good for you. Good for you. It was, but it was more like I was addicted to the really cute patterns of the diapers <laughs> than That's anything. What happened I, to my sister. My sister got addicted with all three of her children because of okay. the patterns. I have way too many in a closet over there that probably need to find a new home. So if you're cloth diapering and you're in the market for new diapers, we can talk. <laughs> I have enough for twins, <laughs> which is a lot. Um, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. but people. People do go both ways. Um, and I know Michaela's experience was, I think I was cloth diapering, but Hadley was already out or something. I don't know, but. Well, for me, I was overwhelmed with just the idea of having more laundry. I already had two kids and a husband that I was, you know, drowning in laundry. And it, that literally was one of my decision-making processes was, oh my gosh, if I cloth diaper, I'm going to have more laundry. But Again, that might eliminate a different problem for another family. You know, that might not be the cloth diapering might be a relief to a problem as opposed to right. presenting a problem itself. Um, that Pauline, you had a great comment. Um, people are asking you, are you still coloring your hair? You shouldn't be doing that. I yeah. colored my hair. I did too. <laughs> Yeah, there's got to be some normalcy and there are some products that maybe you should avoid or maybe try to find some more plant based approaches, um, yeah. but it's not that big of a deal. Um, um, I'm sorry. So apparently we have some people that are saying some inappropriate things while we're live, but we can't see them because we're using Zoom. I'm just. Oh, no. Yeah, no big deal. We're just going to ignore the trolls. Just keep trolling. All right. So um, next. Yeah, just speak to, your beautician. speak to your beautician and, you know, whenever you're getting your hair done, because there are some plant-based um, dyes and stuff and special things they can use for plants. Yes. And yeah, I think yeah, Aveda, well, right? Is Aveda, right? like Aveda salons, they kind of have yeah. more of a plant-based thing. Yeah. I don't know much about them. But. Well, and also being in a well-ventilated area. Yes. Um, is uh, probably something that you want to consider. And I did minimize it too, just so, just because I think I only got it done twice during my pregnancy. Like, yes, I wasn't getting it done nearly as often. Yeah. Right, yeah. but you have to feel good while you're pregnant. Yeah. Let's just get it out there. Um, I thought Pauline also had another good point. She said, you're having a doula again. Um, everything went great the last time. So they, you know, people are like, well, why do you need a doula again? And she said, uh, duh, because I got great support. That's why it went well. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, just because... Um, you experience something great the first time. I, I don't, I don't know why people think that you don't need a doula again, because you're always going to need an advocate for yourself. So. Yes. Um, well, and why, if it works the first time, if it's not broken. Right. I fix it. Right. Fix it. Yeah. It seems like. Um, let's see what else. Um, how about. Um, um, Samantha says that her husband's really pushing her to get just to please get the shot. The uh, shot meaning the epidural? Meaning the epidural, yeah. Um, that is because I think men have a desire, they don't want to see their spouses hurting or in pain. They want to fix the situation. 
in this case in particular, you can't fix, you know, there's a reason why our bodies go through labor. And so it's, we have to embrace the power of the contraction as opposed to fighting the contraction. Um, so I, I would say you, you guys need to have a conversation <laughs> about yeah. your desires even further. Yeah. So. Um, Katie's a first time mom and she's experiencing kind of the same thing. Why do you want to go natural? It's okay to change your mind. Um, the exercise, you shouldn't be exercising. You should be resting with your feet up. Um, there, you know, if you haven't been exercising before you got pregnant, now's not the time to get on a marathon training plan. Right. <laughs> However, if, you know, exercise is proven to be beneficial for both mom and baby, as well as for the labor process and the recovery process. Right. So we are very big proponents of exercising, but exercise is not necessarily what you exercise in pregnancy doesn't have to be some strenuous plan. Um, if you have, if you want to join our full course, we go into depth about safe exercises programs and how to incorporate exercise safely into your pregnancy yeah um and shopping is exercising yes my whole pregnancy so um and there was times where i actually in the in my second trimester when i start feeling better because my first trimester i didn't feel up to exercising right um, which some people don't <laughs> um but the second trimester, there was a couple days where I actually did double headers. I remember my yoga, like, because I felt wonderful. And I remember them being, like, the, the owner was like, wow, you're staying for a second session today? Yeah. So, um, and yoga is wonderful for the body. So Right. Yoga is very good, especially for just strengthening, keeping the core strengthened and your legs for labor because you're – um, if you're, you know, trying for a natural birth, you're using your legs a lot. I think people don't realize that you've got extra weight on your body and your legs are going to be holding you a lot when you're walking and squatting and doing a lot of those different, uh, movements to help. So, so last but not least, let's address the, uh, my sister is pregnant at the same time, or maybe even my best friend is pregnant at the same time. And you guys have two different views yeah. about pregnancy. How do you handle that? Um, that is a tough one because as family, you're probably talking, you're not going to stop talking to your right. family or your best friend. Um, and so, yeah, do you guys have any tips on how to handle managing your family members? Well, Desiree, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> my, uh, so I'm the youngest of three girls. And my middle sister and I, for we just don't see eye to eye with a lot of things in general. And, uh, you know, we just agree to disagree. And yeah. I respect the fact that I, I, what I usually do is I'm the one that says, I understand where you're coming from, but I feel differently about this. And this is what I want. Um, remember, at the end of the day, it's all about what you want, not what yes. they want for you. Right. And, and it's not okay if, if they're not okay with it. That's honestly, that's their issue. It's not your issue. That's their. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not, that's nothing to, that does not um, make, that shouldn't make you feel, you should not let it make you feel bad. That right. is on them. That is not on you. You're allowed to make your own opinions, your own choices. This is your body. This is your baby. This is your birth. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just going to piggyback that. I mean, it's a them problem, not a you problem. So if, if they're getting really upset and they're having a hard time um, talking to you because you differ on these opinions, then it's just a reflection of maybe their own insecurities or just, and maybe they're just super passionate and they think what they want is best for you, but you really have to come from, and Mikayla and I have this as being educators from the space up, we will provide you with the information and what you choose to do for your baby and your family is what you choose to do. And, and sometimes it's best to avoid the topic completely. Like, with, yeah, with, true. You know, <laughs> since you know, maybe just mention that if she brings it up again, just say, you know, we feel very differently about this topic, or we feel have very different opinions. I'd feel I'd feel better if we just don't talk about this any longer between the two of us. Right. Yeah, that's great. All right, guys. So um, I hope we got to answer some of your questions, and you're feeling having you know feeling a little bit better about how to manage other people's expectations. 
But really what it comes down to, again, is knowing your priorities for your birth and being able to communicate them effectively with confidence. Um, and part of, and so once you know your priorities, stick to it and surround yourself with um, knowledge and education and people that are going to help support you instead of knock you down. Right. It's all about community and support. So mm -hmm. with that, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye guys. Bye.